Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whenever you're watching this video for Tots to Teens Tidbits. Welcome. We are glad you are here. Um, today, we are with our repeat performer who is back by popular demand, Dr. Joseph Lamb. Um, he spoke with us about the history of atopic derm, and I seriously learned so much. And today, we are going viral. Um, so we're going to be talking about cutaneous viral infections, and I'm so glad to have Dr. Lamb here. He is clinical associate professor of pediatrics and an associate member of the Department of Dermatology and Skin Sciences, and he practices at BC Children's Hospital and also in his private practice on East 10th Avenue. And he is an amazing pediatric dermatologist and just a wealth of knowledge, and I know we are all going to learn so much, so I'm going to turn it over to his very capable hands. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be able to present here. It's a nice forum and it's great to have pediatric dermatology teaching. And we're all about, you know, sharing uh, all this stuff. So thanks, Atlanta, for putting this together. I'm going to do a quick screen share. And yeah, the title of this talk is Going Viral. And that can mean a lot of different things. And definitely, um, I'm not a TikTok person, but, you know, you can think about all the things that are TikTok and all, all the challenges that are there for pediatric patients. Actually, literally, there are different challenges that happen on TikTok from social media, from the ice and salt challenge to eraser challenge and deodorant challenge. That's not what we're going to talk about today in terms of going viral. We're literally going to talk about viruses, but this could be a talk on its own, all the viral things that are there. So what we're going to talk about today is cutaneous eruptions associated with molluscum contagiosum. And it's kind of neat especially from an American point of view, I'm Canadian, but in America, there has been one medication that's FDA approved since last summer for molluscum, and there's one that just got its um, approval, but it's not in the market yet. So I'll touch on those medications, but just about molluscum in general. I'll talk about options for treating uh, cutaneous warts, including observation, especially observation, because in our kids, sometimes I joke, I've never lost a patient from warts before, uh, but you want to make sure the treatment isn't worse than the disease. And then talking about viral uh, things, we'll talk about the morphological features of eczema herpeticum, because this is different from how normally uh, the herpes virus looks like and, and sometimes fool people. So the, I have uh, disclosures that are there, but none of these companies have any relationship with this talk. And the companies that make the two products for molluscum, I have not consulted for them at all. So I thought it'd be fun if you want to do a pretest quiz, and if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm sorry, <laughs> you can't do this quiz, but I've opened up a poll which is anonymous. And you can either uh, um, go online on this website, you can text, or now we're in the uh, 21st century, you can actually scan a QR code and um, they'll pull up the five options. It is completely anonymous, <clears throat> so you won't be. Uh, uh, tagged to your answer, but it might help. And here's just three questions to start off with. On average, how long does it take for molluscum contagiosum to, res to resolve by itself without treatment? And I'll see, um, the poll should be open, and then we'll see how many people have, I'll give you a few seconds to vote, and then I'll do a quick screen share of the answers. And we see the answer is mostly for C, and some answers for D. And actually, before I forget, let me uh, clear the responses now. And you guys are absolutely correct. The answer is C. Oh, actually, no, I won't give you the answer just yet. <laughs> Keep that in your mind because <laughs> we're going to go through that later. What topical anti metabolite has been shown to be effective for pediatric Veruca? And if you're already in the link, it's I've reset the, uh, the answer so you can answer it. Um, fresh again. I'll give you a couple seconds to see if you can answer that question. And here I will screen share. So some answers for A and some answers for C. Let me reset this as well. Keep those answers in mind because we are going to go back and answer those questions again at the end. So some for A, some for C, and I'll let you know that both of them are used to treat pediatric of uh, but there's one right answer for this question. <laughs> and in patients with eczema herpeticum on the face, what organ system besides the skin is most likely to be affected? I'll give you guys some uh, time to answer that as well. And I'll screen share the answer here. And we have lots of votes for E, 
and some votes for B. And so I don't forget, I'll clear those responses again, and then we'll go to the meat of our talk. Um, so yeah, molluscum contagiosum. These are four different patients with molluscum contagiosum and uh, ranging from different uh, skin colors. And it's a very, very common condition. So if you've never encountered molluscum yet, you will. And if you have kids, especially to go swimming, you'll encounter molluscum. And some parents can even get molluscum as well. Um, top five tips from molluscum contagiosum. Number one, if you wait long enough, they will go away. And this is very important to know the natural history because there, even though there are treatments, it's good to let the patients know if it isn't that bothersome for them, waiting it out is a quite a reasonable option. However, we'll go through how long it takes. And with that in mind, you might think about treatment. Uh, cantharidin is a very reasonable treatment option and it really depends on who's treating it. I know some of my colleagues in Quebec, they love curatage where you scrape it off. Uh, I find that uh, the, pair, the patients aren't as happy with that. And then if I'm going to treat, cantharidin seems to be my most common go-to. Other thing to realize is you can get localized eczema with molluscum, which is very interesting, especially if a kid um, does, doesn't have a history of eczema and they have eczema in an odd location. Look closely because you might see molluscum right in the center. Another very important point is that they can get inflamed before they go away. And I'll show you a picture of some of the inflamed molluscum. It actually looks like a bona fide infection. However, if you culture it, if you lance it, pus does come out but you don't find any pathogenic bacteria. So it's very important to know, molluscum can mimic a bacterial infection like an abscess, but you don't have to treat these patients with antibiotics. Um, now, certainly if they're sick, if they have fever, you could treat them, you definitely could, uh, should treat them. But most of these patients, it's not caused by a true infection. And the fifth point is that you can get scarring, but unlike regular scars, these tend to fade. So let's unpack these tips one by one. Tip one, if you wait long enough, they will go away. This is a Captain Meyer survival curve. And if you ever read oncology literature, this is about patients surviving over time. This is not for patients, this is for the molluscum. So this is how many kids they have uh, with molluscum. If you add, you know, if you round up to 140, round down to 160, about 300 kids with molluscum enrolled in this longitudinal study. And as time goes on, you find that they start losing, um, uh, you start losing kids who have molluscum. The kids are fine, but the molluscum is gone. If you look at the 50% point, it kind of intersects with just over 12 months. And this is important to know because the molluscum don't go away right away. And if they're all over, if they're causing problems, if it's in the face area and the kids are really self-conscious, maybe you might not want to wait. But if they're just localized here or there, not causing much problems, it's good to tell parents it will go away, but it might take time for, before that happens. So the mean time to resolution from this study was 13.3 months. And just know that there are some outliers, but 30% didn't uh, go away until about 18 months. And then at, at two years, there's still 10% of patients who still had that. So it can take longer at times, but as time goes on, it's like your body's immune system recognizes the virus and then can get rid of it. Transmission to family members happens about 41% of cases. So it's good to know. And then for most patients, it has a small effect on quality of life for most patients, but some patients it can affect them quite a lot. So if it doesn't bother them, you can just wait it out and you kind of get the sense of how long to wait. However, if you want to treat, there are some treatment options that are there and cantharidone is a very reasonable treatment option, but just make sure the treatment isn't worse than the disease. And we'll talk about what's involved. So there are a lot of different options and I, I like to put observation as number one. And in our practice and sometimes at the children's as well, um, if a patient is referred and they have a known diagnosis of molluscum, we sometimes put them on the very low wait list because by the time we call them, it could be already gone. However, the, the, the referring docs know that if it causes problems, pain, um, social issues, then we're gonna, they can mention that in the referral, we'll bump them up. Cantharidin is another option. Curatage is where you scrape it off. Liquid nitrogen, you freeze it off, but it is kind of painful. And Miquimod is where you put a medication which kind of causes an immune reaction. Some of the recent data showing unpublished studies show that maybe it doesn't work that well. But speaking of published studies, one thing that is more recent that just came out is berdazomer gel. If you've never heard of berdazomer gel, don't worry, it just came out quite recently. So this is the press release from the company that makes berdazomer gel, like in pharmaceuticals, and this is from January the 5th, 2024, so less than a month ago. The US FDA has approved, um, I don't know how to pronounce this, Zelsuvni, for treatment 
from Luscum contagiosum. Now, this is not available on the market yet. It just got approved. So unless um, you run the people involved in the study, and I wasn't, uh, then it's hard to know the real life uh, use of this. But it seems to be quite exciting. And the neat thing about this is that patients can put this on at home. So you can give them a prescription, they can put it on, and they can get rid of their molluscum. Um, looking at the studies, if you remember the how many um, months it would normally take to go away, it can take some time and definitely see a difference between verdazomer gel and just vehicle alone. But it's also important to know that it's not without side effects, but most of the side effects that happen are just local irritation, pain, erythema, itch on the area. But also point out that, you know, about 5% of the patients did stop uh, uh, being in the study because of the irritation. So something to keep in mind. And it's nice if you have something that patients don't have to go to the office uh, to get done, because a lot of the other things you have to do in office. And Kenferidin is one that uh, I use a lot of, and it is uh, app applied in the office. And here's some interesting facts about Kenferidin. Um, what do these all have in common? This is uh, the blister beetle. This is China. This is the Marquis de Sade. And this is the structure of a protein. Um, well, Cantheritin is a vesicant produced by the blister beetle Cantheris vesicatoria, or sometimes we just call it it's beetle juice. <laughs> kind of fun for the kids, and sometimes it conjures images of Michael Keaton for the parents. Um, but uh, it's produced by this beetle, and as of 2024, the way we get it in Canada, it still comes from the beetle. It's not manufactured in the lab, so it's kind of interesting. Um, and the beetle produces it in every part of the body, and if you have 100% Cantheridin that's there, it can cause a lot of blistering, and that's how it protects itself, and it protects its eggs so that predators don't eat the blister beetle's eggs, or they, if they do, they know not to do it the next time. Um, but the dry body of the Chinese blister beetle has been used medicinally for like uh, over 2,000 years. Um, Cantheridin has a infamous reputation for being aphrodisiac. I will point out it is not an aphrodisiac because it causes swelling, and it can cause swelling of genital areas. It can seem that's an aphrodisiac, but the Marquis de Sade in 1772, who we get the word uh, sadist from, uh, was said to poison prostitutes with candies containing cantheridin to um, increase sexual pleasure. And then this here uh, is not the direction to the airport, but this is the, uh, this is the protein structure of cantheridin itself. And what it does, it, it activates um, or uh, um, the release of neutral serine proteases. So basically, um, I'm sorry, it, it causes the serine proteases to be activated, and then it leads to the blistering in the skin. So this is the back of my own hand. Oftentimes, you put cantheridin on a patient, and you're showing it to um, a trainee. They don't see the blister because the blister happens about uh, four uh, to six hours after the application, and the patient is no uh, not in the office anymore. So if you put it on myself. The next day, you can show uh, patients how that looks like. I realized after time not to do it on my hands anymore because sometimes this is pre-COVID when I like to shake the hands of uh, family. They look at my hand and they have this really like, oh, are you infectious? <laughs> so, um, but it, uh, this is what happens after about 24 hours. And this is after about 48 hours. The blister deflates. And, and for the kids, I say, it's kind of like a birthday balloon. You put it on about four to six hours, the balloon starts. And after a few days, if you do nothing for it, you don't scratch it off the balloon deflates. And then that crust of skin on the surface, it takes about a week before it falls off. And with that, usually the molluscum dots are treating, they're gone. How do you use it? We usually use the wooden side of a cotton tip applicator. So not the cotton side, which will soak up the medication, uh, but the uh, wooden side here, because we have these in the office, you can just use just a straight uh, wooden stick for that. And I put a small amount there and let it dry. It doesn't take very much to have a reaction. Most people wash uh, 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 after the four hour mark and definitely for the one that's commercially available now, they say wash it off. I find that uh, kind of my own trial myself, it, it dries with the plastic film, a collodion membrane on there. So if I wash or I don't wash, I find that reaction for myself is about the same. And so for my patients, I generally just put a sm very small amount and they don't have, if they wash or don't wash, it doesn't make a difference. But I'll say that most people who use it, they tell the patients to wash it off. You test treat five to 10 areas for myself because not everyone reacts the same. Some people have quite a robust reaction. Some people have a little reaction. You want to make sure, again, the treatment isn't worse than the disease. And especially in patients with darker skin, that inflammation that we're causing can lead to post-inflammatory hyper or hypopigmentation. So you want to be careful with that, especially if they have facial molluscum. 
speaking of facial molluscum, I remember at uh, SPD meeting, some people were like, oh, we, we're not going to treat any facial lesions. So somebody did a survey talking about treatment of facial molluscum. And um, in this center, they did. And they found the reason um, that they would normally do it is because mostly because of increasing number of lesions, itch, pick, picking, but then cosmesis and how visible it is. And I say that I, I definitely treat a facial molluscum, but I treat it very carefully. And this is a patient with darker skin. And then if I treat it with a lot and have a big blistering response, sometimes the leftover post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation can be more noticeable than the molluscum. But here, I just treat this really carefully, didn't have much of a reaction, so he was fine with treating the other ones as well. So it can be done, but you want to do it really gently. Um, and here's the um, medication that was approved uh, since last summer for molluscum. And I think it came onto the market in the fall, sometimes September, October. So they call it Wycanth, but this is Gintheridin. Interestingly, they uh, put gentian violet, this coloring in there, so you know exactly where you've uh, treated. And the Gintheridin I use, it, it's, it, it's, it's colorless. But this is nice because uh, it has this color, and I think they put something that tastes terrible in there. So just in case someone happens to try to uh, eat it, it they'll, uh, yeah, they don't have to wait for the blistering reaction. It just tastes awful. Um, but the other thing about this is, uh, just looking online, it looks like a single carton of 12 applicators is $8,500, which is crazy. And uh, we won't go into a whole talk about <laughs> pricing strategies and how um, companies put prices so they can negotiate with the, uh, with the extended care, but that sounds crazy. <laughs> um, so tip number three, you can get localized eczema with molluscum, and sometimes eczema is actually more noticeable than the molluscum itself. Here's uh, the back of the, uh, the legs, the popliteal fossa of a patient, and if you just look here, it looks like regular eczema. However, you know, it's nice in everyday life if you have arrows pointing out other things in patients, and you can see here, and here, and uh, here, and here, these little skin-colored pearly papules in the skin, this is a reaction to the molluscum. And it can get tricky because it happens more often, having this eczema reaction, if you have a background history of atopic dermatitis. And here's a kid where it's hard to see the molluscum. I usually mark out the molluscum uh, with a pen so I know where to treat afterwards, but the eczema is much more prominent. So this is uh, published as a report about uh, 10 years ago, talking about the eczematous id reaction or an eczema reaction right around that molluscum contagia geosome virus. And so with some of these kids, you can see that the eczema can be actually quite prominent, but uh, again, you have the nice arrows that are there pointing out the molluscum contagiosum that's there in the skin. So, I mean, if you just treat the eczema, some of these patients are not itchy, but some of these patients can be very itchy with this. I think it's worth treating. And how do we treat with a topical steroid? And you think, well, it's a virus. Why do you want to suppress the body's uh, immune system with a topical steroid? Well, I find that if kids scratch at this, they can actually spread molluscum to other areas. So I think it's totally fine uh, treating this. And uh, you can even treat the molluscum themselves if you wanted to. So this is molluscum dermatitis or eczematous id. And it's just a host response to the molluscum. And once you get this host response, it might show that you're closer to clearing the molluscum as well. And you treat it symptomatically. It's not a bad thing having it there, but it's one where um, uh, if they're itchy, it's definitely worth treating. Tip number four, and this is very important, especially if you're spending time in the emergency department and see kids coming in with something like this, molluscum can get inflamed, very inflamed before it goes away. And um, here's one uh, article which uh, calls it the bump that rashes, not just having this eczema reaction, but you can have a whole bunch of other reactions as well, including this um, uh, inflamed reaction. So this is a kid I saw in my practice, um, and it, it looks just like an infection. It's hot, it's swollen, it's painful, it's red, no fever, but there's all this molluscum around, and then there was a molluscum there before it got all swollen. If you drain this and it's ripe to be drained, you might get pus, but you won't find any bacteria, aside from maybe uh, staph epidermidis in this. It's just the host response to the molluscum. So this was uh, published, uh, again, about 10 years ago, and they called the B-O-T-E sign, which stands for beginning of the end. But in this case series, I, I think all the kids were mistaken for a bacterial infection, but it was just the host response to the molluscum. Now, if you have molluscum on the skin, the kid scratches it, sure, it's possible you can have bacteria getting in the skin and you can't have an infection, 
But I'll say in my practice, almost all the kids who have this, uh, especially if they have no fever, um, it's all this host response to molluscum and not an infection or bacterial superinfection. And here's, in the case here, here's a bunch of the kids with inflamed molluscum, and it looks just like a regular uh, um, abscess uh, or a bacterial infection, but none of these kids actually had um, a true infection. Tip number five, you can get scars, but these tend to fade. It is a pox virus, and if you're going to treat the molluscum, it's really important to either point out the pre-existing scars before you treat or let the patients know in advance, because if you treat it and the molluscum's gone, Sometimes the family will come back not thanking you, but upset saying, but you put, you, you cause scars in my kid. I'll tell you that if you can it in, the split is in the intraepidermal layer, so you shouldn't get scars, but molluscum can leave scars. So here's a kid, you can see there's molluscum here, and some of these areas here are not actually active molluscum, but old molluscum, and that divot in the skin is the molluscum scarring that's there. This kid's very interesting because, uh, um, all these little punched out um, uh, uh, divots in the skin and the, and the docs, like, hey, it's all regularly spaced out underneath the arm area. Is the family doing anything to the kid? Is it, do you have to worry about, uh, you know, called child protection? And all you have to ask them or show a picture of molluscum contagiosum, say, hey, did it look like this before? And like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when it went away, it leaves these scars. It's very characteristic, these pitted scars that are there from molluscum contagiosum. And here's another kid with the scars from molluscum. It's funny, scars by definition usually should not go away. And if you have chickenpox scars, they can last for life. But I find that over the years, if you see these kids uh, for this or sometimes for something totally different, if they come back as a teenager for acne, you look for these scars and you can't see them anymore. So it's kind of an interesting phenomenon I find for the kids with molluscum scarring. You can tell the family that there's a good chance that they'll actually go away. That's molluscum. We'll move from molluscum which you don't have to treat, but if you're going to treat, yeah, there's a lot of different things you can do. Warts are the bane of my existence because um, I don't know if there's anything that works great for warts, and it's kind of frustrating for warts. So there's this great quote by Voltaire. He said, the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. And he wasn't talking about warts, but he could have been just as well talking about warts. Sometimes I feel all I'm doing is, you know, entertaining the family me spraying some liquid nitrogen, time to do this and that, and just waiting for the warts to go away. And if I'm still seeing them, if they haven't gotten frustrated and left, then I can take credit for it going away, even though they fought it off themselves. Um, five facts about cutaneous warts. I have a thumbs up from <laughs> Dr. Bree. Uh, I think she has the same experience. Warts are very, very common, and they do go away by themselves. Just like velocicum, it's good to know how long it takes before they go away. And it could be glass half empty or glass half full. Salicylic acid persistence is still the best for a lot of kids, but there's evidence for cryotherapy. But if you're going to pronounce cryotherapy, it's cryotherapy because it's painful, especially if you do it properly. And then one thing that I, I, I kind of use, maybe it's glorified placebo, but I find 5-fluorouracil works quite well. I think it's fairly safe, and I use that as an off-label treatment option. But if you pull a bunch of different uh, people who treat warts, you'll have so many different concoctions that are used, and you can go down a a whole talk on different things in compound to treat warts. Fact number one, warts are very common. How common are they? Here's a study where they went in to um, elementary schools in the Netherlands, and these are unselected patients, not patients who presented to a doctor's office, just kids in the school. So they got about a thousand kids, and among them, 33% had warts. Now, some of these kids may have had warts that they didn't even know about because they were kind of small. But, and maybe there's something funny about the Netherlands, but I think that's pretty representative of, you know, um, the general population of, of kids. They touch things with their hands and their feet. They're involved in sports. Uh, they're often barefoot. Um, and, um, uh, and so hands and feet can be affected. It's quite common. So it's good to know. And also, like, if you can clear warts from the kids, it's good to know, hey, if you can figure something else you can do, something you can do at home to treat the warts, that would be useful because there's a pretty good chance you might get a wart again in the future. And if you can find something that works, like for example, a, a routine with salicylic acid, you may not even need to see a doctor. You can just treat it uh, at home. So yeah, 33% of cutaneous warts, that's crazy. Uh, here's another study. Interestingly, this is also done in the Netherlands. I'm not sure what it is about the Netherlands and warts, <laughs> but they look at transmission in families and schools. They, still, they also had a number of kids in this one 
And they found that in about a thousand kids in the years, about 30%. So a lot of the kids had incidental warts. It's super, super common. Fact number two, most warts go away with time. And this is where we go back to Voltaire's quote, the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. Um, so if you look at the same study from the Netherlands, they looked at these kids with warts and they found that about a half of the primary school children with warts were wart free within a year. And that can be a good or bad thing. For example, like, hey, within a year's time, without even doing anything, or even doing something, your warts are gone. However, half the kids, it's still there after a year's time. This is an old, old, old study. You're not, I think, ethically allowed to do something like this anymore where they had a thousand institutionalized mentally defective children, even the terminology is old. And they went in there and they counted their warts and did nothing. And they just went back two years later and said, well, how many kids uh, uh, still had that one wart in that one area? Uh, they weren't looking at the kids had no warts, but just that wart they documented. And um, they found that after two years time, 67% of the patients had complete resolution of that original wart. That does not include other warts that the kids may have gotten in that time. That wart could have had uh, wart babies, but uh, you know, two thirds of them gone within two years time. And similar to the Netherlands study, it was uh, about half of them were gone within a year's time. One caveat is that when they went to see that those patients, that wasn't time zero for when they got the wart. They could have had a wart that was there for three, four, five years. But after the time they saw the patient, um, there's a, you know, two thirds of the patients gone two years. That could be good or bad, depending how you think about that. And this is to show that uh, when we looked at the warts, um, it wasn't the patients were free of warts. They could have had warts in other areas as well. So if left untreated, about 66% of the warts will go away. Um, now, is that good or is that bad? Well, it's kind of like, you know, whoa, half empty, definitely half empty. <laughs> oh, no, no, you're always the best one. This is excellent. Um, it just gives you numbers, real life numbers to tell your patients. How they feel about this, however, depends on if they're that fish on the left or the fish on the right. Uh, but if left untreated, patients can get more warts. Fact number three, salicylic acid and persistence, and that's important, is still the best. And this is from an older Cochrane review from 2006. That's been updated at least twice with some evidence coming up for cryotherapy as well. And the Cochrane review doesn't say what works best, it say what's the best evidence for treatment. And for most kids, salicylic might be the best thing, not just for this wart, but also letting the family know, yeah, your kid's probably gonna get another wart. And if that's the case, you can actually be empowered to treat that at home. So yeah, it's a planner's wart. <laughs> um, triple whammy, one way to do it is apply over the counter salicylic acid. It's the same stuff you use for acne, but instead of, you know, 2%, 5%, you're talking about, you know, 15%, 20%, or if you get higher, then you often need to compound it into a paste. I think past 27%, salicylic acid gets very pasty. So they have wart band-aids with it. Cover with air airtight tape. There's that old study of army recruits where they use duct tape and some of them got their warts gone. They tried to repeat that study in pediatrics with clear duct tape. It didn't really work as well, but I think it's not, not it's nothing magical about duct tape. It's just the fact that if it's airtight, all the sweat that you collect kind of builds up in the skin. It's almost like you're soaking the foot in a water bath 24 hours a day and that skin gets peely. And then you can pair off the dead skin and you repeat. It is a lot of persistence. And sometimes I frame it in a way for patients to understand saying, your wart has a lifespan. Maybe your wart's gonna be a two year wart. Maybe it's gonna be a five year wart, who knows? Um, but every time you treat at home, it's like every day you treat, you're cutting a few, few weeks off the wart's lifespan. It gives them a bit of hope, right? So it's like, you know, if your wart's gonna last for, you know, uh, it only has like a six month lifespan left, then you know, you're going at it, maybe it'll be gone in a month or so. But if your wart has a two year lifespan, at least you're cutting off years off the wart's lifespan. Not entirely scientific, but it gives them a perspective of what to expect. And I think for a lot of things, not just warts, but uh, other medical conditions, having that hope and knowing that what you're doing is not futile can help you persist and can help with treatment. So this is a patient who actually was treated uh, outside with cantharidin. And what happened was the cantharidin caused a blister and then the center cleared and they were referred for a scar after work treatment. I was like, I got good news and bad news. <laughs> the good news is not a scar, but the bad news, this is a ring wart. So I said, you know what, there's different things we can do. Mention cryotherapy. Once the, eye, the kid's eyes get bigger and bigger, when you mention freezing, like 
but there are other options. You can try treating it at home. And surprisingly, they were really, really consistent. And this is just a month later. And uh, this is after two months later, completely gone. Um, now, some areas, the skin can be thicker, like the hands and the feet. So the same amount of treatment um, might not work as well. And maybe this is a work that was, you know, near the end of its life. So we kind of pushed it over the edge. But it can work quite well. Uh, on, the, uh, on the feet, um, so how salicylic acid works, it's not an anti-wart treatment. It just causes basically dehiscence of the skin or the, the skin cells kind of um, um, detach from each other. So what you're seeing there, all that white uh, skin is just dead skin that's waiting to come off. You can even pair it uh, in the office uh, or get the family to kind of uh, use a pumice stone or a nail file uh, to take it down. One way to imagine what to do for warts is that hey, we're eating away at the skin. So it's not, you know, um, it makes sense why sometimes the normal skin will get white first because it's not as thick. And then you want to keep going and going until you get beneath the wart. The thing with viruses is that you only need one virus to make two, four, six, you know, like they'll keep uh, replicating two, four, eight, 16. <laughs> I, I can't double that well in my, math in my mind. But basically, if you don't get to the base of the wart, then they'll just come back. But sometimes it gets really messy. So what do you do? Um, just take a break. That skin will slough off. And then if there's a wart there, the wart has one purpose in life, and that's to grow. And you'll see a little bump there, you know, okay, then uh, keep going. But, you know, Sometimes I can get, um, the skin is all falling off. Like, huh, what's happening there? Take a break. And after two weeks, if nothing's there, then give another two weeks. And if nothing's there, then have your celebration for the end of the ward. Uh, here's a, the, the, the foot. And then when you pair it off, you can see, um, you can take quite a lot off. And for the kids, it's nice to tell them, this is dead skin. So um, there are no nerve endings here anymore uh, because it's all white. All the white stuff is dead. Uh, I, I don't like pairing Worth that haven't been treated because you have all these blood vessels that are there. And even if it doesn't hurt, you just have blood all over the place. Um, but here you can pare it down quite nicely. And if you see the skin lines going through the area of the wart, you're basically done with the wart. But if the skin lines are still distorted, then you let them know, okay, you can go at it again, but now you can go straight to the base of where the wart is. And here's the other side that's been paired off. So you can get a big chunk of wart off by doing that. And it's nice and gentle and it doesn't hurt the kids at all. So tips for treatment, I'm basically like their cheerleader. It's really, really easy to give up on salicylic acid. This is in real life. But if you look at studies, looking at salicylic acid, here's one where they compared cryotherapy with salicylic acid versus wait and see. These are adults, so maybe more responsible than kids, or maybe not. But if you look at what happened for a lot of these patients, 24 of the 84 stopped the treatment protocol or had treatment uh, hindrance in a study. So it's almost half of the patients didn't even do it. So in real life, there's going to be a lot of patients who um, don't do that. So being um, a cheerleader for the family helps. Or if you find that uh, it's very easy to forget or for them not to do it. Well, first of all, I go back to the first principle where, you know, make sure the treatment isn't worse than the disease. For salicylic acid, it might not hurt, but if the, body, if, if the family is so wrapped up and so many different things, and there's one extra thing on their plate, and they get treatment exhaustion, you don't have to treat. But if they're going to treat, sometimes you can help um, um, get them on a schedule by seeing them more frequently. Not because you have to, but it's kind of like the, the dentist phenomenon. If I, um, when I was a kid, I didn't floss that well. Sorry, dentist. Um, but now I floss really well. But if I had an appointment coming up with my dentist, oh man, that week I'm flossing. Um, and the, the hygienist always knew that I didn't floss, but the same thing, if you have an appointment coming up, they're like, oh yeah, I got to put that, um, that treatment on my wart. It might help. Uh, note that the treatment endpoint for many wart studies are three months. If you pick up a salicylic acid box, sometimes it says, you know, if the wart isn't gone within a week, check with your doctor. And maybe that's a medical legal thing to make sure they're not treating something worrisome as a wart. But that gives uh, un unreal expectations for how long it goes away. So I tell my patients, you know, not just the, not the, just the lifetime of the wart, but hey, if you're looking at wart studies, then we're talking about months. So don't give up too early. And younger kids, I can just pair them in the clinic with a surgical blade so they don't have to file it down themselves. Sometimes for younger kids, if you file down too much at home and it hurts, kids are like, yeah, you fool me once, but you're not fooling me the second time. So then I can do the pairing in the office for the family. Or if I have a nice resident, they can do that. <laughs> Tip number four, cryotherapy should be pronounced cry. Oh, therapy, because if you do it right, it's going to hurt. So many different cryotherapy devices you can use. You can use a spray, which gets directly to the skin. 
You can use the cotton tip applicator, which is a bit more, uh, maybe a bit more precise if you do it that way, but it does kind of warm up a little bit by the time it gets to the skin. So for warts, usually I do uh, three cycles, and depending on where it is, uh, 10 seconds, depending how, um, how the patients can tolerate it, up to 30 seconds uh, on the foot if it's really, really thick and the, and, and the kids are like, yeah, go at it. Um, uh, there is evidence for cryotherapy working for warts and then effectiveness of treatment. There's some evidence. So the most latest Cochrane review did say, hey, there's some better evidence for like liquidation working for warts. And this is the review from um, 2020 showing that the best evidence so far is salicylic acid. The effect is small, but the best evidence is there. But cryotherapy, there is now some uh, more evidence saying cryotherapy um, has some weight of evidence behind it as well. So take on points, cryotherapy hurts if you do it right. And so if the patient's like, no, don't do it. And the parent's like, no, you got to get it done. This is where as a practitioner, you, it's almost like um, tongue in cheek, like child abuse for the kid. If you're treating something that's painful, that's uh, very um, uncomfortable for the kid, treating a condition that is not life-threatening um, and they don't want it done. Sometimes it's a, it's a matter of counseling the family or maybe even showing the parents how it feels like <laughs> when it's frozen. Um, if kids can tolerate it, it works. And in studies, you compare one with the other, but you can use it with salicylic acid in real life. And fact number five, I find five fluorouracil is a useful off-label treatment option. There's a lot of treatment options available um, including Canada antigen, including different, you know, acids you can mix and compound. I find 5 4 years old, it works, uh, it, it works decently well. Some warts are more stubborn, especially the mosaic type of warts that are there. And the HPV types 2, 27, 57, they're less likely to demonstrate spontaneous resolution. Now, looking with your eyes, you can't tell, but sometimes these are the, um, the mosaic warts that are there. So 5 4 years old, it's a fluorinated pyrimidine, interferes with DNA synthesis. And it's used for adult skin diseases, AKs, basal cells, conoloma, cuminata, so genital warts. But um, someone did a study looking at kids using 5% 5 fluorouracil. And basically, it just stops cells that are dividing rapidly from dividing rapidly. So you can put it on different warts, but you know, careful using on areas that are ulcerated. And don't use it on the periungal area, because that's the area where the cells are dividing rapidly. And you know, you could potentially have your nails fall off temporarily by putting it on the, the periungal areas. In the study, they soaked it, paired it, put it on, and covered it with duct tape. And um, they found that um, in all the patients, they had at least one wart that showed some sort of improvement. Now, balance that with the natural history of warts too. But 36% had complete resolution after three months. And at six months of these patients, only one wart recurred. So it's not magic. And if it was, that's what that my go-to for all patients. At best, it, it, it helps. At worst, it's almost like a glorified placebo, but you do buy time until the warts are gone. One thing I, I, I was gonna, I forgot to put the uh, slide for this in, but uh, a colleague from, I think he's from South or North Carolina, Craig Burkhart, he had something where he says, um, at exorcise, not excise the word. <laughs> what he meant was, you can tap into the kid's magical thinking. And uh, sometimes, and I actually did this for one patient, what's all over her fingers, like, ah, oh, man, you know, it's going to take a lot of time to treat that at home and freezing it or, you know, all that stuff. So, yeah, you know, let's try this. I'm going to circle one of your words and I'm going to bring out a quarter. And then here's your quarter. And until the next month, well, yeah, we'll freeze some of the words, but until the next month, you talk to that wart every night and tell that wart, you belong to Dr. Lamb now. And let's see what happens. Of course, it happens, nothing, right? So she came back after a month and the warts were all gone. And that was amazing. And she's such a smart girl. She's like, Dr. Lamb, I've also calculated you owe me about $5.25. <laughs> so it's that magical thinking that's there. I think I've, uh, I've heard some pediatricians in Montreal, if they see a kid with wart, they kind of wink at their colleague and then tell the kids, I have a a witch doctor that can come in and curse your warts. And then the, the, the doc, the other patient comes in like, says something magical and poof, your warts are cursed. We'll see what happens next week, uh, next month, they might be gone. And the success rate is almost as good as cryotherapy. So there are different things you can do. Uh, so yeah, you can sometimes exercise <laughs> rather than excise, definitely definitely rather than excising warts. So people used to do, but yeah, you have any wart virus left, you have a scar and a wart. 
So take a point, five fluorouracil is useful and safe option. That study showed that the kids did fine with, uh, fine with that. And you can do this at home. If you're gonna do this, avoid the periungal area, don't put on the mucous membranes, don't put on ulcerated skin. So that's uh, two viruses. We got molluscum contagiosum and we got warts. Now, mystery case. And here you can get your, uh, um, the QR code ready again. Actually, the same QR code. So if you have that um, site open for uh, poll EV, you can vote there. A 10-month-old female with a known history of topic dermatitis, she has a recent flare of eczema. So they go to use topical steroids. It doesn't get better. Someone swabbed it, and it's staph aureus. Like, ah, that's why. Put in a course of oral antibiotics, not getting better. And it wasn't a resistant bacteria. This is how she looks. And I will point out that there is about a bunch of crusting, and there was staph aureus here. But what's key is if you look underneath or the background, all these little punched out erosions or ulcers on the skin, they all look about the same. That's the biggest clue to this. So why isn't her eczema getting better? And you can scan the QR, you can text, you can um, go online. Is it because mom isn't putting on the cream? That's A or one. Or B, is there a resistant bacteria causing the infection? C, she just has bad eczema. Number four, it's laundry detergent. Or in Vancouver, is often it's a food that she's eating. Or number five, she's a viral super infection. Let's see if I can go to the screen share for the answers. And yeah, 100% E, 100% correct. I'm gonna clear this so I don't forget. And E, it's a viral infection. And I think uh, if you didn't know, the title of the talk might have given me a hint. <laughs> but uh, it's because she has a viral super infection. And this is eczema herpeticum. So this is disseminated cutaneous HSV infection. And morphology is different from usual herpes infection. Normally you see the, the classic description of the dew drop on a rose petal. It's a vesicle on erythematous base. But here it looks very, very different. You get punched out, monomorphous erosion, which means they all look about the same. And oftentimes you don't see any vesicles that are there. And the lesions tend to be more prominent in areas of active dermatitis. So here, this is a kid where you can, you know, may see, see some vesicles that are there that are still intact, but most kids, they're ruptured. And this one, you'll see that there's no intact vesicles. There's some pustules that are there, and they often have a bacterial superinfection with Staph aureus. And that can lead you astray, because if you just swab for bacteria and you don't suspect HSV, you can treat the bacteria, but then you're missing a lot the underlying condition there. And there's a kid where you can see all these punched out almost like a little punch biopsy that made little circles on the kid's skin. They all look about the same there. Complications, if it's in the head and neck area, watch out for carotid conjunctivitis. Oftentimes they have a bacterial superinfection, but when I see the patients, usually they've already been either uh, treated on spec for this or swabbed and treated for this. Fluid loss, viremia, if it's, if it's quite serious. So the treatment is systemic acyclovir, oral versus IV. I think the folks at SickKids, they say, if you're under a year of age, you're admitted for, um, IV. This kid was actually from pretty far out and mom had other kids like, you know, she's looking pretty well. We're going to have her see the ophthalmologist urgently. And, um, but uh, she's no fever. If we can keep close contact, we don't have to admit you in hospital. And she did great with oral acyclovir. Make sure they're hydrated. That's more for IV acyclovir. Acyclovir can precipitate in the kidneys uh, if you're giving it IV. So you have to make sure they're well hydrated. Pain control and then treatment of the secondary infection. So this is her before, and this is like about five days later with treatment. And so looking fabulous. So practical pearl here is think eczema herpeticum. If you have any febrile atopic patient who has punched out lesions, cluster vesicles, but oftentimes you don't see that, or if it's recalcitrant atopic dermatitis, because I'm sure you're gonna see lots of eczema in your practice, just keep that in your back of your mind. It's something you always scroll through in the back of your mind to think, is this eczema herpeticum? Because it could be, yeah. And so to review, um, tips for molluscum. If you wait long enough, they will go away. Cantheridin is a reasonable treatment option. It's not the only option. And there's some you know, newer options, um, especially Berdazomer gel, which works through the nitrous oxide pathway, which is fascinating. You can get localized eczema with molluscum. So don't be fooled. They can get inflamed before they go away. Don't be fooled by that either. And you can get scarring, but those tend to fade. Tips for warts. Warts are really common. They go away by themselves, but you know, it can take a long time. It can frustrate the patients, the families, and the physicians as well, but they do go away by themselves. If you're gonna treat, salicylic acid persistence is still the best in terms of evidence-wise, but you really have to persist with that. 
I tell the patients, you have to be more stubborn than the wart. The wart's really stubborn, but if you're more stubborn than the wart is, you'll win. And cryotherapy should be pronounced cry. No therapy. And 5 fu is a useful off-label treatment option topically. And then for disseminated cutaneous HSV, eczema herpeticum, think about that if you have punched out lesions, monomorphous, clustered vesicles, or recalcitrant atopic dermatitis. So we'll finish off with the three questions. On average, how long does it take for molluscum to resolve? Two weeks, four months, 13 months, three years, or 10 years? Survey says C, excellent, perfect. Um, you guys are paying attention. <laughs> and then um, 13 months on average, or 13.3, if I'll be uh, precise from the study. What topical anti-metabolite has been shown to be effective? And uh, it's a bit of a, uh, a trick question because Canada antigen has been effective, but it's not an anti-metabolite. <laughs> it kind of stimulates your T cells in your immune system. So um, vote for the answer there, and it's A, yeah. Um, and the evidence isn't good enough for the Cochrane Review to recommend it, but it's something that I think it's something that you can use safely. Uh, and then there is a um, off-label, but uh, studies in children. And then lastly, in patients with eczema herpeticum on the face, what organ system besides the skin is the most likely to be affected? The CNS, vestibular, gustatory olfactory, or ophthalmological system? And the answer is E, the eyes. And that's the last question, but I'll clear just in case. Yeah, congratulations. You guys got 100%. You guys are all ready to do PS dermatology now. <laughs> so that's the end of my talk. I'll stop the sharing. And um, I think we have time for questions, if there's any questions. Yeah, let's see if we have any questions in the chat. No questions right now. But that was amazing, as always. Like, great knowledge, great information. I always learn something new. Clinical pearls, like... I feel like I have a whole necklace now because of your clinical pearls. <laughs> and then also the humor, like you always find a way to bring that, which is, I think, part of what we do well too as pediatric dermatologists, because we have to use a little bit of that to get through our cryotherapy <laughs> sessions, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. But yeah, so as far as, you know, molluscum. Wow. I even had a mom ask me, like, do they have support groups for this? Like, no kidding. The, this can be so traumatic, right? And then grandma's always saying, well, I've never heard of this. What is this thing, right? And, you know, it's, it's crazy. I do think that when we started vaccinating, and again, this is my theory that when we started vaccinating for chicken pox, that kind of left the scene and left this opening for molluscum to kind of take hold and be kind of the next new pox virus. Um, yeah. And again, who knows? Who knows why? But it is ubiquitous, right? And basically, yeah. if you're a kid in the world today, you're going to get molluscum, you know, like, yeah. Absolutely. It's, yeah. It's just the way it is. But yeah, that dermatitis. Wow. You're right. That can really be more troublesome than the molluscum, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that study too, like you pointed out, it even said that, you know, you can spread it like you shouldn't maybe use a topical um, like a TCI or a topical steroid. But I used it all the time, all the time. Um, yeah. just because they care about the itchy scratchy. Some of them don't even care about the appearance of the bumps because they're skin colored, but it's more that the skin looks unsightly when they get the, you know, eczematous response and it's itchy and the kids can't sleep. And then they do spread it. I agree with you. Scratching spreads it way more than using a topical steroid any day of the week. In my humble opinion. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Yeah. 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 So I would topical steroid them. And then tell them, you know, we're going to clear the forest from the trees. And a lot of times the molluscum were kind of gone when they would do that for a couple of weeks and then come back. And then we're like, you know, and I agree with you 100% with the test spots. Um, I learned that over time. I had one mom and again, you can tell them they're going to scar just because it's a pox virus, but you know, they get so upset sometimes if they go away and they have that, even if you've warned them. And so I really, in my practice started uh, early in my career, I would just treat them all right and get it one and done and, you know, tell them there might be a few stragglers we had to clean up later. But wow, it not only makes the kids like miserable if they have a lot of molluscum, because you really shouldn't treat a bazillion molluscum at one time with cantheridin, um, just because it's it really does make the treatment worse than the disease. And 
again, like, yeah, I just always would do a test spot, like a few test spots before I would have them come back if they wanted me to treat a lot. Like I just got in the regular practice and some people would be mad and I'm like, you can be mad at me and you can go find another dermatologist that will treat them all, but that's not going to be me. Um, and, you know, yeah. we kind of tried to set expectations when they made their appointment. If they were coming in and they were saying, I want molluscum treatment, even the girl at the front was like, well, they're probably not all going to be treated today. Kind of like when people want to come in for a biopsy and, you know, it's like, well, we need to evaluate and then we'll probably set you up another day when we're doing procedures to get a biopsy if it's not anything harmful. So yeah. anyway, sure. yeah. Yeah, and managing the, kind of expectations. The, yeah. yeah, the sweeten the expectation too, because uh, you can say, well, we treat a few of them. Uh, and this happened for a patient where they had like basically 100 molluscum. Like, you know, sometimes if we treat them, the body's immune system gets in on the game. So there's this kid that had, you know, like 100 molluscum. So I said, yeah, let's treat five to 10 of them, see how he does and bring him back in a month. So he came back in a month, like, how do you do? He's like, oh, yeah, it wasn't that bad. You know, like for a day, he I felt uncomfortable. It's like, excellent, let's treat them all. And the dad's like, treat what pull up his shirt nothing left and there it's like yeah the immune response can kind of kick in so sometimes you can tell the patients hey we're not we're going to treat five because we want to see how uncomfortable it is for your kid but also we'll see what your body's own immune system can do and if it does it sometimes you can get them gone without any discomfort at all so you can kind of sometimes sell it that way too yeah absolutely absolutely do you use many over-the-counters have you ever recommended any over-the-counters for molluscum much? much not really. I mean, there's a lot of products that you can find over the counter. Some people use tea tree oil as well, or things that are not even licensed for, or not even uh, advertised for molluscum. But I kind of tell them, you know, like anything you use, like if the patients do use something like uh, tea tree oil or lavender oil, I find that it doesn't really work unless you get a bit of a uh, allergic or irritant contact dermatitis. So it's kind of like the same thing. So even though it's natural, it doesn't mean that it's like a, well, anything that has an effect on your skin or in your body, it's having an effect. So it's nice to kind of know exactly what to expect and have a bit more control. But yeah, it's molluscum, so they want to do that. The kids smell nice, and then <laughs> they can do that if they want to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. That's what I used to counsel. Like, they're going to get inflamed. They're going to be irritated. They're going to scratch. But if you want to use some, and I would kind of list a few. I use Zymoderm. I don't know if that's available there, but it's available on Amazon. Um, yeah. So anyway, it was one and it's a, a combination of a bunch of kind of, you know, essential oils, but it does induce an inflammatory dermatitis, right? And that's really what is causing the molluscum to kind of hasten in their in their resolution. So yeah, 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 yeah. And then as far as warts, I agree with you, like 5FU works. I would always try to, unless it was like, especially if it was on acryl skin, I don't know if you ever do this, but a lot of times I'll do sal. I used to do sal acid at night under occlusion, have them kind of scrape it off in the morning and then add the 5FU and then put a bandaid on it. But again, that was more just for acryl skin, not for any other place, but it's irritating, but it would work. <laughs> yeah. And acryl skin is so hard to treat. Sometimes I do, I, I, I instead of using topical salicylic acid as a liquid, I get the salicylic acid impreg impregnated um, band-aids and then put 5 so slap that band-aid on and it slowly leaches out salicylic acid. It's like, if you want, you can even leave, leave, leave it on for a couple of days before you take it off. Cause then all that sweating stuff is gonna like just macerate it even more. And like, we don't wanna be, wanna do that to, we don't wanna do that to normal skin, but we wanna be mean to the wart. So that's fine to do. Yeah, and every time they shower or they sweat, then it just gets even more, but then the rest of the skin also gets white too, but you get all that, yeah. That sloughing off skin that happens in the wart. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's brilliant. The sal acid band aid. I use a lot of times over the counter. It's called wart stick. Again, I, it was available on Amazon, and it's a forty percent sal acid. And it's just real easy because it comes in a thing that looks like chapstick. But I'm always like, put not on your lips, <laughs> like big on the <laughs> tube, I'm like unless you want some big old cosmetic lips, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, but did you, have you ever done? And this started to be kind of my favorite, especially for the kids that tended to have molluscum and warts, which definitely there are those kids because they're both really common viruses. Um, have you used much cimetidine? I ended up prescribing a lot of that toward the end of my career. I didn't at the beginning, but I was actually fairly impressed with cimetidine. And, you know, I always told the parents it was off label and we have really no idea how it truly works. Um, but have you ever tried that? I've tried it as like a last resort. And it's funny because I think there's a shortage of ranitidine a couple of years ago here. And then there's like a run on cimetidine. And so we couldn't find it. 
But then for kids, oftentimes with the, I think it's three to 50 milligrams per kilogram or something like that, the dose, yeah. I forget. Um, then they had to compound it. And then some kids didn't really like the taste of it that much. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it, hard to say. Cause I think um, I, I use my back pocket cause sometimes if they're like super frustrated, like we want to do something else, like, yeah, you can try this. But I'm not sure how much of that is that is actually working or if it's just kind of like uh, buying time until it goes away. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. But I I ended up doing it a lot more and it seemed to be more successful than not, in my opinion, and pretty well tolerated aside from the taste. Like you had I was like, don't fight them to get this medicine down. Like, again, don't make the treatment worse than the disease. And really, in the studies, they did TID dosing, which nobody can take a medicine three times a day consistently. Um, so I always did just twice a day. So it, yeah, it's like 30 milligrams per kilo per day. And I would divide it basically 15 milligrams per kilo per dose. Um, and then give three months worth and tell them, you know, to keep going because it increased over that three month span in the studies. But if not at three months, no use keeping it up. And maybe that's just the three months of waiting for the work to go away. Like you said, do the song and dance. <laughs> or maybe there's something to, you know, with the, um, um, how the body's immune system responds to things, you know, yeah. I mean, it'd be really interesting to do a study where you just give the kids um, flavored water and see what happens with the warts. If they think it's for the work. So I saw, I saw this patient and his, his mom had grown up in France and she's like, Oh yeah, I had a wart and my doctor told me to look at it every night and say wart go away three times in French. It's like, oh yeah, how old were you? You were like five or six. Like, no, 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 I was uh, 18 years old. <laughs> I was like, really? And did it work? It's like, yeah, it worked. So I don't know. Sometimes the immune system has some funny things that we can't really quantify as well, but you can tap into like, if someone says, oh yeah, you know, um, oh, this is your unlucky week. Everything that happens that would normally happen, you think, oh, it's because of my unlucky week. And sometimes if you're anxious about that, you might not sleep as well. And you might, you know, make more mistakes and it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I wonder, you know, if, uh, cause the, the, the mind is something we haven't really tapped into and definitely, you know, placebo works, nocebo works as well. We just can't ethically prescribe placebo without telling them it's placebo and they kind of negate a bit of the placebo effect. But I wonder, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. the very interesting thing to look at. Yeah. And I love that you brought up because it's free, right? The positive visualization or the, you know, like kind of talking your warts away or wishing them away, you know, and when I would do cryotherapy, I'd usually always do it in the cup and blow on it and have them blow because it's more fun and do the Q-tip because it seemed a little, you know, they're less scared because it doesn't make a noise. And then, you know, dump it out what we had left and say warts be gone. Right. And that's the fun nice. part of being a pediatric dermatologist with the theatrics of it. And the kids would love it. But um, yeah, I ended up toward the end of my career doing a lot more immunotherapy. Um, mm. And I really love that. That became kind of my one and done for most warts. Now I did intralesional candida, but that hurts. And I would, I didn't love doing it, but I would do topical. Um, I use diphenyl cyclopropanone, but you can use square. Yeah. Have you or anybody at your institution tried that? So we, yeah, yeah, in the past um, for alopecia areata, we would use that mm -hmm. for patients. So then we sensitize them with 2% DPCP and then use a lower concentration to go up. So we have in our fridge tons of 2% DPCP. So like, you know what, let's try that. And sometimes at work, um, usually I use, do that for more recal recalcitrant warts. So it's hard to know if I started off with that, how well that would work. But now that there's other treatments for alopecia areata, then we basically don't, I, DPCP was kind of messy. You have to, you know, uh, for the patients to do it for alopecia areata. So, uh, we did it, but then it's really tapered off these days. So I don't really have much of that. But actually, it's funny, like uh, for the patients, I would kind of take what we had in our fridge and use it, put it on them in the office. But I never thought about having patients go out and um, fill a prescription for that. It's a bit tricky because I think you need a compounding pharmacist that has like a hood with the acetone and all that stuff to get it done. But uh, yeah, in the end, I, I think... Um, for warts, I've kind of resigned myself to be a bit of a therapeutic nihilist. Like, okay, let's try this. Don't come back too soon because I want to make sure that you have time for the natural history. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I ended up becoming the biggest fan. Like, as I would do the positive visualization and tell them, like, even the pro basketball players will visualize themselves making baskets and then they make more baskets. So I'm like, you have to visualize your skin with no warts on it every night as you're going to bed, right? Like, just visualize what you want. 
Um, and so I had them doing that. And then I did a lot of the DPCP and I would sensitize all the warts, not on the face, um, with the 2%. I would, you know, sensitize up to, you know, if they had lots, I wouldn't do more than like 10 or 15 at the most. And I would tell them it's going to be like a poison ivy like reaction. And I was like, basically the warts are really good at hiding out in the extra skin. So your immune system can't see it. So what we're doing is making a red flag to your immune system to come look at the DPCP. But then when it gets there, it realizes, oh, hey, there's a wart that I'm supposed to be fighting. And that's kind of how I explained it to the kids and the parents. And, you know, said you can, you know, you're going to react like poison ivy potentially, but most kids did fine. I did have some blistering reactions or really big, you know, exuberant reactions, but then I would prescribe them usually a 0.01%. And I had a compounding pharmacy that would mix it up in the acetone. And I just had them put it on at home once a week and usually by three months. And again, maybe it was the, the, the placebo effect, right? But I will tell you, well-tolerated can be done at home. And again, I would say 97% of my patients toward the end of my career got it, if not more. <laughs> you know, that's a good idea because it's actually painless for the patient. And yeah, then painless. if you get a blistering reaction, you can even, you know, you can kind of calm it down and or tell them yeah. it's a, if it's not the bad, it's a good thing to have that. Maybe I'll start using DPCT again. Yeah, I'll send you my yeah. protocol for it because I'm happy to sing the praises of it because then the kids aren't tortured. They're doing something at home that's fairly inexpensive. You don't have to torture them in the office. The parents don't have to torture them at home. It's only a once a week treatment. So they're not, you know, getting so fatigued by the daily repetitive nature of it. Um, and there's no pain to it. I mean, I seriously am the hugest fan of topical immunotherapy for warts. Like, I would sing its praises all day long. So anyway, I'll get to, I'll send, I'll email Brilliant. you my protocol. And if anybody wants it, let me know. Now, also a few other things besides a big thank you to Dr. Lamb. He does an amazing case of the week, y'all. Um, and we can send that out afterwards, you know, how you get signed up for that because I've been getting those and I enjoy getting them. And I learn still from, you know, good reminders if I already know it. So, and that's great, I think for students and residents and training your cases of the week, I've, you know, I think that'd be very helpful. 